Good morning or good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Betsy Cooper and I am the director of the Aspen Tech Policy Hub, where you are an incubator training technologist on how to get more involved in policy through policy training programs and challenge prizes such as today's events. On behalf of my colleagues at Aspen Digital and the Commission on Information Disorder, we are delighted to kick off this live Information Disorder Prize competition. By the end of today's session, we will have awarded $75,000 to one of our amazing contestants. The Commission on Information Disorder was created to identify the most critical sources of mis- and disinformation and deliver a set of recommendations to help government, the private sector, and civil society respond to this challenge. Following months of internal discussion and consultation with experts, the commission, comprising a diverse group representing academia, government, philanthropy, and nonprofits, released a report detailing 15 actionable recommendations to combat information disorder. These recommendations fall into three categories, increasing transparency and understanding, building trust, and reducing harms. The Aspen Tech Policy Hub, with support from Craig Newmark Philanthropies and Ex Ante, an initiative of Schmidt Futures, launched this information disorder challenge grant to fund unique and innovative projects that make meaningful progress towards ending information disorder in direct connection to one or more of the commission's 15 recommendations. Project teams were invited to identify a particular recommendation from the commission's report and propose a new untested solution that would specifically help accomplish this goal. We selected four semifinalists that we are excited to present to you here today. We awarded them each $5,000 to develop prototypes of their deliverables over an eight week period. And today is the day each team will be presenting their accomplishments and explaining how their contribution is the most unique and innovative project making meaningful progress towards en ending information disorder. The projects will be judged live after which one team will be awarded a $75,000 grand prize towards executing its proposed idea. Our judges for this event are three of the original commissioners from the Commission on Information Disorder, Chris Krebs, Amanda Zamora, and Deb Roy. The run of show is as follows. Each team will have five minutes to demonstrate their proposed solution. The judges will then have five minutes to ask questions of the team. If you, as the audience, have a question that you think the judges should ask, feel free to submit it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. After each team finishes presenting, the judges will depart to a separate deliberation room, while Vivian Schiller and Ryan Merkley of Aspen Digital will provide an update on the commission's work. After deliberations, the judges will return and announce the winner. So without further ado, we'd like to introduce our first team, Alteria Inc., an experienced design company based in Los Angeles. Alteria creates live and digital experiences that draw on history and art to explore the theme of agency. Today, they're demoing Agents of Influence, a media, liter a media literacy video game that teaches middle and high school students to recognize misinformation, think critically, and make more responsible decisions. Representing the team today are Anahita Dalmia and Jasper McAvoy. Over to you, team. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Betsy. Whenever you're ready, Jasper. And just to clarify, we have 10 minutes to present, not five, right? Just wanna make sure. Yes, you have 10 okay. minutes to present, five minutes for questions. Apologies. Sounds good, five. thank you. Good morning, everybody. And thank you so much for having us over here. Today, I'm going to be sharing with you Agents of Influence a spy-themed media literacy video game that teaches the next generation to combat misinformation. The term actually originated in the Cold War era, where agents of influence was used to refer to spies that spread mis- and disinformation in foreign countries. We wanted to reclaim the term to show people that their agency, their ability to navigate the world around them, and their influence, their ability to make a difference, are positive traits. For us, it started during the pandemic when we realized that we were at a historical pivotal point. Every decision we made seemed to matter more than ever. Whether to wear a mask or not to wear a mask, how you speak about the Black Lives Matter movement, who you vote for, we were all contributing towards making a new normal. 
That's when the problem of mis and disinformation came to our attention. As we realized that it was disempowering people by misleading them into taking decisions that led to un unwanted outcomes. It is for that reason that we created Agents of Influence. And let's look at that. Welcome to Agents of Influence Cyber Danger, an educational, spy themed media literacy video game created to empower the next generation of students to fight misinformation on the internet. Virginia Hall High is under attack. A nefarious organization named Harbinger is manipulating the student body with lies and deception. Luckily, you and your team, the Agents of Influence, are there to stop them. Students will learn to question the trustworthiness of information, investigate the trustworthiness of information, and apply this knowledge to make better informed decisions. It was during this design process that we realized that misinformation was a pressing global problem. And our vision for this game is that it's used in classrooms across the world, empowering the next generation of digital citizens. Our goal is that by playing this game, students learn to realize the impact information has on their worldview and decision-making and have the ability to find the accurate information so that they can make decisions that truly leads to the world they want to see. We also intend for this game to be a doorway to a host of civic education and civic engagement. In many ways, the same way the Aspen report was a doorway for us. We realized how complex the information ecosystem we were living in was, that we were just a small cog in this machine, a subcategory of a subcategory. But we also recognized that by empowering people, particularly the next generation, we are going to have a positive ripple effect in all of the other areas of Aspen's recommendations. That was one of the factors that we considered while picking our target audience, which is 13 to 15 year olds. This audience is also at a critical stage of development where they're building lifelong habits and they're always online. This has inherently changed the way they interact with the world around them. This generation expects constant engagement and immediate feedback, making them particularly receptive to gaming as an educational approach. Research also shows that gaming is a very powerful educational tool as it is highly transferable, provides immediate and specific feedback, allowing people to change their habits in real time and is engaging, which means that it re resonates emotionally, is highly memorable and makes students actually want to learn. This is all that, so now that we've established that, let's have a look at the story world of our game. Life moves fast at Virginia Hall High School. When I first arrived, I was just a normal freshman. Now, I'm a spy. A few weeks ago, a shadowy figure known only as Harbinger started causing trouble at school. Harbinger used a device called the Lullaby to transform some of the students into a kind of mind-controlled being that can influence the thoughts of others. We call them sleepwalkers. These altered students are dangerous assets in Harbinger's plots to spread misinformation. Luckily, I've joined with a group of student secret agents to stop them. We call ourselves the Agents of Influence. In this adventure, students are going to be encountering three main challenges, which take the form of our core games and are where they'll find majority of their media literacy skills. The first game is the conversation game. One of the most negative impacts of misinformation is the polarization we are facing today and that people have forgotten how to have healthy conversations with people they disagree with. This game aims to solve that and also works towards another Aspen recommendation of healthy digital discourse. In this game, students are tasked with investigating a suspect and, by, and they do this by picking dialogue choices. Positive dialogue choices such as leading with empathy will get this person to open up, but negative dialogue choices such as being critical, blaming or being defensive is going to get them to stop talking to you. Our next game is the analysis game. 
students are overwhelmed. We all are overwhelmed with information today, and we've stopped looking critically at the information we are consuming. The analysis game helps us overcome that. In this game, students realize that their secret operatives hiding in underground tunnels beneath their school. To reach them, they need to overcome a security system by correctly answering true or false questions about an article they read and reading a and playing a strategy game on the left side. Through this, students learn to tell the credibility, bias, and purpose of the content they're consuming, but also recognize the difference between the main idea and nuance in this content. Because today, the same content can be propaganda, marketing, and entertainment all at the same time. Our final game is the research game. And th this is based on social media and the internet, which is where people find the majority of misinformation in their daily life. So it can be highly transferable. Students are tasked with finding culprits who are spreading mis and disinformation on their school social media by researching posts further and tagging them as accurate or misleading. In this process, they tell the difference between fact and opinion and cross verify information across sources to find trends, discrepancies, and make judgments on what information they should be trusting. If you successfully complete all of these games, you will have beat Harbinger and saved your school from misinformation. However, even though the game ends there, your engagement with the topic does not. We intend to give students misinformation toolkits, which includes tools such as fact checkers, bias tests, and partner curricula. We recognize this is not a problem we can solve alone and, to, and want to work with everyone else in the ecosystem to get maximum resources out there as easily as possible. We also want to give students the opportunity to pitch real world solutions to real world problems through things such as design competitions and want students to feel empowered to make decisions on accurate information that will lead to the world that they want to see. We expect these students to become advocates for the truth, sharing what they learn with their friends and family, making a positive impact on their community and having a ripple effect on all of Aspen's recommendation, but creating the next generation of responsible digital citizens. Our goal over here is to have over 100,000 students playing by 2024. And we are already well on our way. We have three school districts in California, Ohio, and Pennsylvania committed to piloting this game, bringing us to about 10,000 students with further distribution partnerships with organizations such as Rotary and teacher associations. We also want to ensure that this game is effective. So we have research partnerships with WestEd and Stanford to get feedback and continue iterating on the game. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to us. We look forward to working with everybody in this room to solve what we recognize as one of the most pressing problems of our era. Um, back to you, Betsy, happy to take questions. Fantastic. So now I'm gonna ask the judges to come up and judges, you have five minutes to ask the team questions. Who would like to go first? I have a quick question. Um, I was, first of all, this is fantastic. Thank you so much um, for taking the time to put this together. My question is just to, to understand a little bit more about what your outreach strategy is to build participation in schools. You've got these three pilots, like what are the measures of success that you have with these pilots and how do you um, expect to, to expand, I guess, in other districts or leverage other community partners to, to reach your goal? That's okay. We have once we have some slides on this. Can I uh, start sharing screen again, or do you want me to take it off screen share? Um, whatever you. you okay, cool. I'll put it back on screen share. So we have recruited over five hundred students beyond yeah. these pilot programs for our test. Some of our metrics include how much students care about the topic of misinformation whether they're going to like research before they share information again, how confident they feel about discerning misinformation and a number more. If you want, I'm happy to send you our entire research plan after this, which WestEd and Stanford have worked with us to design. 
Um, we have a number of distribution partnerships, which include media literacy curriculum, Rotary clubs. We've done our, over 40 presentations already, and many school superintendents are Rotarians. So we get to chat with them directly on interest in this game. Um, teacher associations, including National Association of Media Literacy Education, English Teachers, the Writing Project, and more. And once we have proof of concept through this pilot game and effective research, many people have said, come back to us to share this game so we can take it you know, mainstream. And we've also designed this game flexibly so it can be fit in a major, like a variety of curriculum, English class, media literacy class, after school curriculum, and more for it to be as widely usable as possible. Other questions from the judges? Yeah, um, so I have a uh, one kid at least that's right below your kind of target audience. I have a 12 year old. Um, and, and seeing how they play games, uh, I think gamification is a great way to engage. I guess my question is, from a from a gameplay perspective, is this a uh, you sit down and you play it for thirty minutes, you play it for five hours? Kind of what's the user experience and and expected? Uh, is it one time? Is it multiple times? You keep coming back. So something we learned was really important is flexibility. We hope for students to start playing this game in the classroom and our two hour module, first two hour module will be broken down into 30 minute segments. They can play them independently or they can play all four, bringing them to the ultimate narrative conclusion. The goal is that they get invested in the story. So even if they don't finish at school, they'll finish at home. We intend to make several more modules, putting us at over 10 plus hours of gameplay so that students students can engage with this topic holistically and the lessons actually are deeply seated when they're learning rather than something in our information era that they check in on, forget about and move on. Great, thank you. I'm curious um, when you talk about, um, you know, uh, looking for accurate sources, just how are you thinking of for let's say, um, if there's some skepticism about the, the game and some parents saying, I don't want this as a basis for my kids forming their, you know, kind of being uh, influenced in, in ways I, dis, I, I question, how will you define accuracy um, that sort of underpins the, the structure of the game? That's a very good question, particularly because that's a problem we are already encountering. The way we've been tackling it is that we've been emphasizing this game is skills oriented. We are not touching upon any real world problems in the game itself. You're going to be talking about school elections and vetting school sources in a fictional world. So as long as we are teaching them the skills correctly, how do you research, check multiple sources, have different perspectives, can you recognize credibility, can you recognize bias, they can't say that this is inaccurate, and we understand there is a lot of nervousness around the word misinformation, particularly because of the tension and misinformation, free speech, and the fact that many times things exist on a scale of truthfulness, we want to encourage those conversations. Sometimes you can't always find what's most accurate, even if you know the knowledge exists or the information exists out there. That's something to be conscious about in your decision making. And we want to give you tools, resources, skills, and most importantly, a concern for the information landscape you're living in so that you're best equipped to make responsible decisions with all the information you have on hand. Fantastic. And that's time. Thank you so much to the Alteria team for presenting. We really appreciate it. Next, we'd like to turn to our second team, Ratitube. Ratitube seeks to help users discover, search through, and analyze hard-to-find YouTube content. Today, they're showcasing a tool to automatically detect and trace harmful narratives spread through YouTube videos. Presenting today are Cameron Ballard and Eric Zimmerman. Over to you, Cameron and Eric. All right. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for your time. Uh, my name is Cameron, and I'm a PhD candidate at NYU Tandon's um, Cybersecurity for a Democracy Center. Uh, I'm here with Eric, who's a technology fellow at Human Rights Innovation Lab. And we want to talk about a tool we've been building to discover and trace the spread of harmful narratives across YouTube. 
Um, so this whole thing started when Eric and I wanted to look into content moderation on YouTube at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we knew that YouTube was a big source of disinformation, uh, including conspiracy thinking, extremist content, and foreign influence operations. But we thought it got a lot, of, a lot less attention than uh, sites like Facebook and Twitter when it comes to disinformation. Um, and sure enough, when we started looking into content moderation, we realized that there aren't very many widespread research tools for this kind of analysis. Uh, and we think this is due to two main problems. The first being that there's so much content on YouTube and audiovisual material is difficult to research. So a two hour long video has a lot more kind of fluff, but also a lot more uh, content than the 140 characters of a site like Twitter. As well, the recommendation algorithm and opaque search engine make it difficult to find content that you're looking for. Since so much of content discovery on YouTube is driven by algorithms, it's very hard to find content outside of a community that you're not already a part of. And um, so we designed the first prototype of Ratitude, uh, which keeps, uh, which indexes the transcripts and metadata of a bunch of different channels, a number of which had been identified as radical or potentially harmful by previous research. Uh, now, but we recognize that that's not enough to solve the kind of complex problem of disinformation on the site. Um, so we've been building a tool that merges qualitative and quantitative research methodologies to trace narratives. Um, we think this goes a long way towards addressing a lot of the recommendations in the Commission on Information Disorders final report, but especially in areas of increasing transparency and harm reduction. Um, so by having this kind of data public and easily searchable, uh, we can not only increase public interest research of uh, disinformation on, on YouTube, but we can also help verify any sort of content moderation that YouTube may or may not carry out as well by figuring out how these narratives spread and how much they're driven by major content creators versus uh, other methods of uh, disinformation spread. Um, we can add more accountability to super spreaders and maybe counter these narratives before they cause any real world harm. Uh, in fact, our tools are already being used to address some of these problems. Um, and we see it being useful in a wide variety of use cases, uh, including but not limited to uh, understanding foreign influence operations, uh, increasing election integrity, um, better platform auditing as called for in the new EU Digital Service Act, as well as combating extremism and increasing ad transparency. Uh, in fact, it's already been used by researchers at the Shorenstein Center looking at uh, voter fraud claims during the 2020 election. Uh, Asian Americans Advancing Justice Group used it to find instances of anti-Asian hate and calls for violence, uh, which they presented in front of a congressional committee. Uh, as well, the Times London used it to find anti-vaccination videos um, that, uh, that are still being monetized through advertising on YouTube. Um, recently, we've been working with a group called Sparvarius uh, to fight white extremism on the site. Um, and as part of that, we've been building a prototype for Aspen, which Eric is going to walk you through now. Yeah, so to give a specific example on how Redditube tries to solve a case of radicalization, I'd like to show this research uh, collaboration we did with Sparvarius. And for this, we've been specifically looking into Media to Rise and the affiliated militia group Patriot Front. And Media to Rise is a propaganda outlet that is promoting the white power movements through a series of documentaries and video reports. And one of their productions is this Exposing the Truth in Waukesha documentary, which exploits and frames the Waukesha Christmas parade attack as an anti-white terror attack. All their official YouTube channels have been deleted from the platform, but YouTube is still being used to reach a new audience, which they cannot reach on all tech platforms. In one Telegram message, the groups ask their users to upload backups of the film uh, on the disguised titles. And we can use RedditTube to discover those videos and see how they spread to the platform. And for this, we need a couple of seed videos and channels, which you found on a Telegram channel, and which we then submit uh, to the crawler. And just to make clear, we made this, this front end during the, the competition, but parts of the back end we already had. Uh, and under the hood, this tool works by uh, looking at the comments and public subscriptions. In the past, YouTube has sometimes been seen as more of a video platform than a social media website. But there's actually a lot of interaction going on between users as well as users and creators, but also between creators that interact with each other through video collaborations or video responses. Uh, and a recent survey also shows that YouTube is actually the most popular social media platform in the US and is used by 81% of the population. So to go back to, to our results, once the crawler is done, we can find those channels that are being watched by the same audience. And through both the graph, as well as the list, we are able to find channels that are in close proximity to each other. We use the three-dimensional graph here, which does look really pretty, but we quickly find out that a two-dimensional graph uh, might be a bit easier to understand. Um, so just to explain the results that we got here, 
The red circles are channels that are only showing media to rise content, while the black circles show a much broader variety of contents. And to also uh, make clear how this works, these tiny circles are users subscribed to those YouTube channels. And to filter out as much noise as possible, for this graph, we are only using uh, showing the users that are subscribed to a media to rise channel. And in the left bottom, we find a cluster of white nationalistic YouTube channels ranging from commentators, but also uh, to European fascist movements. And just by looking at the black dots, we can already find uh, channels that share a big uh, overlap in audiences. And what's also really interesting is in that in the top right corner, we found a cluster of weightlifting channels. The one with a big red dot is posting both media to rise as well as weightlifting content. And the users around those channels are subscribed to both those weightlifting channels as well as the channels in the white nationalism cluster, which really shows how this particular cluster serves as a gateway to white nationalistic content. Um, so the next step would be to move over to a more qualitative analysis. And for that, we need to select the most relevant channels. For the pilot list Pavarius, we just did that through a spreadsheet, but we also have plans to optimize the tool for that as well. And from there on, we can search within the transcripts of those relevant channels. Uh, and through this, we try to solve that other problem that Cameron mentioned earlier. There's just too much video material on YouTube. And in many cases, we just need to find the relevant parts. So in this example, we're specifically searching for the word Waukesha. Recent anti-white terrorist attack. To play a song from my second album, Home, um, to help promote the new um, terror in Waukesha documentary by Media to Rise. And uh, if I remember correctly on their tele... And already we find many new connections which we couldn't directly see in a network graph. We see neo-Nazi Mike Enoch appearing in a video. And apparently there's also some sort of singer-songwriter actively promoting this documentary. And together with designer Bernard Langer, we're working on a narrative tracing functionality, uh, which is a way to link different pieces of narratives together. And in this example, we are linking how these Media to Rise documentary uh, spreads in other, other communities such as the previous mentioned singer-songwriter one, but we're also using a simple topic modeling uh, implementation to suggest new search terms um, that can be found in the, the transcript that we found here. Uh, but in the future, we also want to implement suggestions based on, on the node positions in the network graph that we made. So for instance, with the earlier mentioned singer-songwriter, the node that is closest to her is actually the online music festival uh, that she performed in. And another no close note is an, a musician that she has collaborated with in the past. So I want to keep this tool freely accessible for academic research and journalists, but we're also looking for a more commercial model to sustain this, uh, collaborating with the Global Disinformation Index to explore future usage of RediTube to limit the amount of advertisements on harmful U YouTube videos. And we think that could be this really interesting synergy between civil society users on the one hand and brand safety on the other to subsidize this. And beyond searching for funding to further develop RediTube, we're also looking for partners to collaborate with as well as better users. In the near future, we're also organizing workshops in which you try to uncover harmful YouTube communities such as the one uh, I've been showing earlier. Um, so feel free to reach out at uh, info at redditube.com and giving it back to Betsy. Thank you so much, team. Uh, exciting presentation. Judges, uh, feel free to come up. And who would like to ask the first question? Chris, you want to go ahead? Yeah, sure. So um, I think, you know, in terms of success, what does success look like for the project when it's fully deployed? You know, what's there are a number of different use cases, but how do you, you know, what's, what's the greatest possible application of the tool uh, in your view? Is it on the platform level? Is it a uh, independent NGO? Is it a government agency? How are you thinking about this? Um, yeah, I mean, so for the kind of civil society part of this, we've been specifically targeting mostly journalistic or academic researchers. So getting it in the hands of um, 
other researchers to help them do research on YouTube is kind of our ideal use case, um, since that tool uh, doesn't really exist. Um, and then in addition, we've been, like Eric mentioned at the end, we've been trying to kind of uh, subsidize that through some more uh, commercial partnerships. Um, so I think, I mean, ideally we want other researchers using this to carry out this kind of uh, research on YouTube since uh, Eric and I aren't really confident being arbiters of truth, but we do want to kind of uh, open up this um, platform for uh, greater transparency. I mean, you can look at like, there was a recent letter from I think 80 different fact checking organizations um, calling for like more third party research on YouTube and, and more platform participation. Um, so if we can encourage that, that's that's awesome. Yeah. So quick, quick follow up. Yep. Um, thinking through, you know, the the tool, it seems to me, um, the way you have it kind of optimized right now could be repurposed. I mean, there, there are a number of different given the search parameters and things like that. So do you have any consideration of, uh, uh, you know, kind of prevention of abuse of the tool for any nefarious purposes? Have you thought through that aspect of it? Yeah. So, I mean, the most obvious is where we have been very careful in terms of like what data we make public. So we are um, scraping through users, for instance, to carry out this discovery, but we don't want to highlight any uh, like users that are not uh, already posting content. And so we're focusing on kind of content creators that are already public uh, as well. Um, any kind of um, larger scale users, uh, we require um, like, you know, authentication and accounts so we can kind of make, uh, keep an eye on like what the tool is being used for. So basically the higher profile channels we're going to leave open publicly, but for any sort of more specific narrative tracing work uh, that, you know, might be used to track activist organizations, things like that, like that, that will require um, authentication and, and, you know, participation of the team. Yeah. Got it. I have a question about um, really interesting work. And I, I do think it's important to shed more light on YouTube for the reasons you've highlighted. Um, what level of um, data access would you need to, to operate this tool at scale? And if YouTube became aware of your activity, is there any is there any dependency on levels of data access that could change? Yeah, so um, ideally we would like to have a bigger access to the YouTube API. Um, right now we're, we're using a combination of, of techniques, um, including some scraping as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, there is like, we, yeah, we would very much like to collaborate with YouTube on this um, actually, because we do think it's, it's very essential to do that. Yeah, and I will say like for the more commercial work, so some of the work we're doing with ad transparency, um, that's with a group who has kind of active uh, active relationships with Google. Um, so for any of, of that work, we definitely have to be more above board in terms of how we do the data collection. Um, however, I think there was a recent decision that we were really excited about uh, in the case of a company that was scraping LinkedIn publicly. Um, that was decided that, that this kind of scraping of public data uh, is allowed and, and um, should be allowed to happen. And so we're, we're hoping that, um, you know, uh, the, the greater kind of pressure on these platforms encourages uh, allowing more scraping and, and transparency efforts. Amanda? Um, a quick question maybe that follows a little bit more um, to Chris's, how do you imagine um, evolving, I'm sure you've got a catalog of, of terms that you're using and building as you're, you know, discovering more abusive and harmful content. And um, as we all know, there is more and more, um, there are more and more tactics to evade that type of tracking and detection. So, I mean, obviously some information is better than none at all, but like, how are you um, envisioning strategically just staying on top of the kind of semantic aspect of, um, you know, getting as much signal versus noise as possible? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the easiest part of the, I mean, easiest answer to that is, is so for like channel and content discovery, we actually use a lot of um, other tactics that aren't reliant on transcripts or speech or, or terms like that. So for instance, we look at shared audiences to determine shared content rather than um, the actual, you know, rather than searching for specific words, um, which helps discover this content without that kind of like um, semantic evasion, I guess. Uh, as well, we we kind of leverage like other access to other platforms where some of this organizing happens uh, as ways to to uh, better track these communities as well. Um, and 
I will say that's a tough problem. And, and I think part of the solution comes from the users to the tool. Um, so we can do our best to you know, increase transparency, provide this data publicly and give people help for signals in terms of like uh, other channels to check out or other things to search for. Um, but in the end, it's, it's also up to kind of the researchers using the tool to uh, decide what is important for them to, to research. And we, we want to leave that open to um, kind of more active civil society members. Yeah. Fantastic, that's time. Thank you team for your presentation. We really appreciate it. And now we're going to move on to our third team. Ranking Digital Rights is a program at New America focused on corporate accountability for human rights in the digital age. Um, for this information prize competition, the team has focused their project on making the online ad economy more transparent and accountable. Presenting their work today is Natalie Marischal, Zach Rogoff, and Alex Rochefort. Over to you, team. Thank you, Betsy. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. To fix information disorder, we must fix online advertising. I'm Natalie Marichal, Policy Director at Ranking Digital Rights. Over the past two months, my team and I have been developing model ad policies that incorporate 10 essential practices that companies must adopt to significantly reduce the spread and threat of disinformation. Today, we're gonna to show you why we must demand more transparency and accountability from big tech, the elements of our model policies and how we built them, and why starting with sound ad content and targeting policies will lead to better outcomes for free speech, more effective content moderation technologies, and greater integrity for our information environment as a whole. So why focus on ads? The pathologies of our global digital ecosystem are intertwined with advertising supported platform business models. Harms are in the ads themselves, in the discrimination that ad targeting enables, and in the incentives they create for platforms algorithmic recommendation systems. They also provide revenue for disinformation for profit outlets, often without the advertiser's knowledge. This image comes from our 2020 It's the Business Model report, where we first recommended a focus on ads. As the image illustrates, we've been saying that to combat disinformation, we must focus not on the speech itself, but we must go upstream and look at the targeted ad business model and demand that companies implement ad content and targeting policies that anticipate and prevent harms by adhering to human rights-based standards and to companies' own obligations to respect and promote human rights. Right now, online advertising is driven by the logics of automation, scalability, and increasing profit margins. There are hardly any safeguards to stop purveyors of disinformation to take advantage. Our goal with this project is to introduce transparency and strengthen accountability to force companies to create and enforce these safeguards. Since 2015, RDR has set the gold standard for corporate accountability for human rights in the digital age. Our research methodology evaluates companies' policies and practices on 58 indicators in three categories, governance, freedom of expression and information, and privacy. In 2020, we added new indicators on targeted ads and algorithmic systems, notably those used to curate and moderate content. We know that this is really central to how big tech operates, but so far, our research shows that companies are very opaque about this. To develop model policies, we need to understand First, the harms that we can attribute to ads. Second, how those harms might be mitigated through better practice. And third, what transparency we can reasonably expect from companies. We identified 10 ways to determine whether a company is being transparent enough about its ad systems. The idea being that this transparency is the first step toward accountability and evidence-based policymaking. Then we applied these 10 indicators and six existing ones from our established methodology to Meta and Twitter's ad businesses. We looked at things like whether the rules for ad content and targeting are public, how the company actually enforces these rules, respect for data privacy, and whether the company does prior due diligence to make sure its products won't cause or contribute to human rights violations. The results aren't great, but the important thing is that the indicators themselves provide a roadmap for companies, concrete advocacy targets for civil society, and a framework for policymakers as they consider regulatory interventions. We also went beyond our established roadmap approach and created model policies that would earn a 100% score in our assessment. If the research indicators provide a roadmap, these model policies are the destination. If you choose to invest in this project, we'll extend our research to more companies like video hosting sites such as YouTube and ad exchanges, the intermediaries that facilitate ad auctions for websites all over the internet. 
We'll engage with companies directly on these issues and publish a report and public data set. Crucially, we'll produce concrete recommendations for companies and policymakers, which will form the basis for civil society campaigns to bring our recommendations to life. I'll now turn it over to my colleagues to share some examples of the problems we want to address and highlights from our research findings. Hi, I'm Zach Rogoff, and I'm a research manager at Ranking Digital Rights. For me, one of the most infuriating things about working in the platform accountability field is how often companies seem to be taken completely by surprise by problems that basic due diligence would have helped them anticipate. For example, in 2020, people were able to advertise sales of human organs on Twitter. And in 2021, the Tech Transparency Project, using only Facebook's built-in search, found many groups advertising human smuggling services on the platform. Human rights impact assessments are a methodical way of thinking through the worst case scenarios for a company's products. They are foundational to business and human rights. Yet across the board, companies are failing to do them, much less take steps to mitigate risks. With the incentives of the surveillance advertising business model being as they are, this essentially means that advertisers can do whatever they want until the platforms are publicly embarrassed enough to stop them. Until the Fair Housing Act of 1968, it was common for mortgage lenders to purposefully exclude people of color from some neighborhoods through a practice known as redlining. Redlining is partly responsible for the segregation in this demographic map of Detroit. Unfortunately, redlining is echoed in today's digital redlining, which can happen when ad targeting parameters exclude people belonging to a protected class, such as race, age, or gender. The point of targeted advertising is to show different ads to different people based on who they are and what they do online. Sometimes that's benign or even useful, but it can also constitute illegal discrimination when it keeps certain people from seeing ads for jobs, credit, or housing. Digital redlining and ad targeting can happen two different ways. One is for an advertiser to explicitly say, for example, do not show my housing ad to black people. The other way is for the platform to use opaque targeting optimization algorithms that even its own engineers do not fully understand to further refine the ad's audience beyond what the advertiser specified so that it performs better. It's pretty clear that the systems for enforcing platforms ad policies need to be improved, but perfect enforcement is unlikely. We need a way to audit the full set of ads that run on platforms to find ads that are against the rules and keep pressuring companies to improve their enforcement systems. The best way to do that is through a public ad transparency database, also known as an ad library. Without comprehensive ad transparency databases, it will remain time consuming and expensive for third parties to verify that platforms are enforcing their own policies. And policy without enforcement is just public relations. Thanks, Zach. My name is Alex Rochefort. I'm a policy fellow at Ranking Digital Rights and a PhD candidate in Emerging Media Studies at Boston University. Let's start a review of, with a review of our top line findings comparing Meta and Twitter. First of all, both companies received failing scores. Meta does achieve a slightly better result than Twitter, and this is due primarily to Twitter's failure to disclose anything across several indicators. This is a particularly interesting finding in light of our big tech scorecard, which places Twitter at the top of all other digital platforms. It scores particularly well in categories related to freedom of expression. As it relates to advertising, however, its disclosures leave a lot to be desired. Let's take a deeper dive into a few specific areas. As Zach explained, whether or not a company conducts impact assessments for its targeted advertising practices can have important consequences for on and offline harms. And the disappointing conclusion is that neither Meta nor Twitter does well on this issue. Meta scores 21% here because it performed a limited impact assessment on its targeted advertising systems as part of the civil rights audit it agreed to after settling a case with the Fair Housing Alliance. Along with the NAACP, the group had sued Meta for allowing advertisers to purposefully exclude Black people from seeing housing ads, which is illegal. There is no evidence that Twitter has ever done this kind of due diligence. This is an example of how we would write a full model policy for impact assessments of targeted ads. Obviously, this is a lot of text, too much to walk through right now. Instead, I wanna just focus attention on how this model policy incorporates the various indicator elements. The yellow text bubbles point to specific aspects of the policy that we evaluate. Our next example asks whether or not a company clearly discloses that it does not perform tar uh, algorithmic targeting optimization after an advertiser sets targeting parameters to avoid discrimination. To receive full credit on this element, a company needs only to add an additional sentence clarifying that they do not permit this practice. Of course, 
as with all of our indicators, a company also needs to do what it says. Looks like we had a mismatch in slide um, there, but um, we do also evaluate um, ad transparency databases. Uh, we'll get into the specific aspects of what we would expect such a da uh, database to disclose, like the scope of the library, targeting parameters used in ad deployment, the cost of an ad, and more. Once again, Meta receives a higher score than Twitter with 36% to Twitter zero. This is because Twitter shut down its ad database after it stopped running political and social issue ads in 2019. Here, I'm just wait for the slide change. And here we have a model policy for the ad library. You'll note that we have a screenshot of Meta's library and an X over Twitter's now defunct database. Here we want to make the point that not all policy disclosures need to be lengthy. Although implementing the complete set of ad library disclosures for a full score would demand additional technical and operational steps, the policy itself can and should be straightforward. Natalie, you're on mute. My Lord, you'd think I'd love learned about this over the past two years. Uh, our work, an investment in our project would be supporting a team with a proven track record of impact. Our work influences company policies, shareholder resolutions, national legislation, and the work of intergovernmental institutions. Civil society groups around the world adapt our methodology to research the companies and issues most relevant to them, and they do advocacy campaigns based on the results. By funding us, you'll send a strong signal to advertisers, to policymakers, to advocates, and most importantly to companies that the era of lawlessness in online advertising has got to end. You don't have to support a ban on surveillance ads to support basic transparency and accountability standards like the ones we're proposing. For years now, Silicon Valley leaders have been telling us that before we know it, their AI systems will be good enough to rid the internet of disinfo and other harmful content, and we just need to trust them to nerd harder. That's naive technosolutionism at best. Machine learning has a role to play, but- Time is coming. Not so. enough. Thank you. Back to Betsy. Thank you very much. Thanks team, we really appreciate it. Um, and last but not least, we'd like to introduce our final team, the Observatory on Social Media. Based at Indiana University, the Observatory on Social Media unites data scientists and journalists to study the role of media and technology in society and build tools to counter disinformation and manipulation online. Today, the team is showcasing an open source public tool to identify misinformation super spreaders, accounts that amplify bad information at large scale. Representing the team today are Phil Menzer and Matt Deverna. Over to you, Phil and Matt. Hey, Betsy, real quick. Are we going to be able to ask? Oh, I'm sorry. Or... I'm so sorry. Questions. Thank you. <laughs> we'll go to questions first. Then I will have already done my introduction. My bad. Chris, over to you. Yeah, I just, I think the kind of the top line question, I think you answered in the last slide and there was a question in the, um, uh, in, in the Q&A box about incentivizing participation. So can you speak a little bit more about your model and, you know, I, I was thinking through your elements and how you came up with them and, and how would they know, but can you speak a little bit to the foundation you've laid over the last several years in terms of promulgating a set of expectations that companies might be able to meet? Sure thing. So the beauty of our model is that it doesn't require companies to uh, to participate. We do the evaluation based on publicly available information, and then we publish the results. Uh, so the companies that we evaluate in the big tech scorecard, uh, by and large, do uh, engage with us throughout the research cycle. Um, they don't always agree with the standards that we set, uh, but they accept that they uh, that they have normative value and that there's a lot of buy-in from the community there. And so the idea is to uh, set a standard that that is grounded in uh, in expert uh, consensus and uh, to uh, build uh, build pressure on the companies from all directions uh, to move in in the direction that that our roadmap sets for them. Okay, and quick follow up. As I was listening, it was clear to me that you're obviously measuring and you're you're evaluating the platforms themselves. Are you also evaluating the companies that are actually advertising and how they decide to engage on the platforms? Because I think that's a useful indicator too in in corporate space. Sure. So that's something that uh, that that we would do uh, as part of the next phase of the project, but it was not part of this prototype. Uh, I guess a question to sort of build on that. I am just wanting to, I think I understand that there's several points of pressure that could come from simply compiling this publicly available data and making it more accessible, which I think is a noble effort. But 
what is the desired effect really here? Is it to inform legislation so that there is more oversight of this? Is it to pressure the, comp the platforms to create this ads database? Is it to um, inspire, you know, companies to change ads that are already out in the wild? Like, what, there are lots of different areas for pressure and I'm just wondering if, if, if there's a, a priority set there for you all that you've thought through or that research helps inform. Yeah, re great question. Realistically, with advertising, the, the goal is to influence legislation or regulation. If companies want to get ahead of, of that process and start voluntarily meeting uh, meeting these standards, that's wonderful. But I do think that legislation or FTC rulemaking will be required. Thank you. Just to clarify, the when you talk about the ad database, you might have said this in the presentation, I missed it. Um, you're also talking about um, some kind of transparency of the reach and the sort of different um, demographic dimensions of the audience that is reached for the ad. That's part of what you're calling for, ideally would be made transparent. Um, well, we were specifically talking about the targeting parameters so we can know who the uh, who the advertiser was intending to reach. Yeah. Uh, but yes, we would also like to see who has been reached so that you can see what the delta is between th those two things. Because if there is a difference between the intended audience and the um, de facto audience, that strongly suggests that the platform introduced uh, some level of, of discriminatory targeting through the optimization algorithms that Zach was talking about, for example. Well, it, it may be that, or it may be that there's um, underlying correlations between um, attributes of the population and the the targeting dimensions. It could, and then and that may or may not actually constitute uh, illegal discrimination on under different civil rights statutes. Um, it, the devil's really in the details there. But the point of the this the point of disclosing this information is to be able to pinpoint where there might be discrimination to allow for further investigation and then remedy of the problem. So just to be clear, the, the what you just proposed to us includes both the in the the targeting um, intention and the actual reach. You, That's you're right. going for both. Okay, thank okay. you. We have time for one more quick question, if there is any. If not, I'll read one from the chat. Uh, what incentivizes social media companies to do this? Public pressure, uh, reputational harm, and the fear of regulation. Fantastic. That's a great note on which to end. Thank you. And again, sorry for almost skipping your Q&A, but we've got lots of great people uh, who fixed it for us. Um, so now uh, we will turn over to the Observatory on Social Media. Phil and Matt, over to you this time for real. Thank you, Betsy. Hi, everybody. I'm Phil Menser. I'm the director of the Observatory on Social Media, uh, or Awesome, as we like to call ourselves. And I'm here with Matt Durena a Knight Fellow at Awesome and a PhD student. And we wanna tell you about misamplifiers, a public tool that we would like to build to identify hidden super amplifiers of misinformation. Well, that's a mouthful, but of course we've all heard about misinformation super spreaders. Um, this was initially highlighted in a paper in 2019 that showed that 0.1% of users, so a very tiny fraction, were responsible for sharing 80% of fake news. And this had been, has been talked about a lot. Many of you may have seen the report uh, more recently from the Center for Countering Digital Hate on the Disinformation Dozen, showing uh, in this case, in the context of anti-vax misinformation, that again, a very small number, just a dozen of very influential accounts uh, are responsible for a great portion of uh, anti-vaccine misinformation. We've studied this problem ourselves, uh, in particular, among others, in the context of uh, misinformation about uh, COVID vaccines. We have a platform called Covaxi that Matt has co-developed, where we track data about uh, COVID vaccine, uh, especially from low credibility sources, and we look at uh, how that can be associated with real world outcomes. For example, decreases in vaccination rates at the state and county level, and we just found some very interesting results were published a few days ago. Now, uh, in looking at the data, both from Twitter and Facebook, we look at where is this information, uh, this misinformation coming from. Uh, sorry for the complex plot, but the take home message here, if we look at the left, is that 
the original posters, um, you know, there, there, is a, there, is a, it, it, there is a great variety of accounts that post the original infor uh, misinformation. But if you look at most of the posts uh, that come in terms of reshares or retweets, they come from a much smaller set of users. So uh, th these, these, these um, uh, you know, most of the retweets originate from a small number of accounts. Again, we call these super spreaders. And not only that, but again, on both platforms, it turns out that these tend to be not unknown accounts, but elite, um, well-known influentials, often verified accounts. Who are they? Uh, well, on Twitter, for example, uh, the number one spreader of misinformation recently has been Children's Health Defense. I'm sure many of you have heard about it. Um, it is disheartening to see that it gets uh, more, uh, more reach, more posting, more visibility than uh, reliable sources like CDC and WHO. Um, here's an example of a tweet. Um, uh, and you see that uh, in this particular case, the tweet has been retweeted by Robert F. Kennedy, who runs this organization. And so if you, we are attributing uh, all the analysis based on super spreaders today are attributing this misinformation to the, to the origin, to children's health defense. But in this case, a lot of people may have been exposed to that information through an intermediary like this account that actually happens to have four times as many followers as the organization account. So it could be that there is a very important and unseen amplification effect that you don't observe if you just look at the Twitter data as we've been doing until now. So that's what we wanna do. We want to help identify hidden super amplifiers of misinformation and quantify, quantify and visualize their impact. These are, these, are, um, these are accounts that normally are not observed in current analysis of super spreaders. It turns out that this actually is a problem that poses a very serious technical challenge. Now, uh, just to give you a sense of that, let me show you a very simple example. Let's say there's a piece of misinformation that is shared and a bunch of accounts uh, retweet it. This is, this is what the late data that we get, we and any other researchers today get from Twitter. All of the retweets uh, are retweeting, appear to be retweeting the original poster. So that would be, you know, if this piece of misinformation goes viral, that, that's, that's the account that would be labeled as super spreaders. However, imagine that we could reconstruct the actual diffusion cascade and see who's retweeting whom. We might notice, as in this example, that there is an intermediate account that, and that is really the super amplifier. The original account maybe was retweeted only a couple of times, but maybe at a later time, a very influential account steps in, retweets, and now most of the people are actually exposed to that misinformation through this uh, intermediary. Uh, so this requires reconstructing the diffusion cascade. Um, this is not possible using directly data from available from Twitter, even less for other platforms. But what we've been working on is efficient approximation algorithms to reconstruct these uh, cascades with, with high accuracy. And um, to illustrate how we do that in our early uh, prototype, I'm going to uh, let uh, Matt uh, show you a live demo of, of our current prototype that we just built in the last few weeks. Uh, Matt. Hi everybody, um, I'm really excited to show you guys my amplifier today. So uh, as Phil mentioned, the, the purpose of this tool is to allow people to uh, uncover hidden amplifiers and misinformation on Twitter. So we imagine a website that will look um, something like this, really simple to use. A user can come to the website and search for a hashtag, a keyword, a link, really anything you can think about searching for on Twitter, um, we, would, we would let them sort of search for misinformation campaigns related to that search. For today, for the prototype, I'm going to show sort of a random, a random search. So you can imagine a user would come and click this search low credibility for links button. And you can see that misamplifier creates this really cool um, 3D network visualization where the nodes here are representative of users and the edges are representative of retweets. Um, so holistically, what we're getting uh, in, this, uh, in this example is a sort of random sample of misinformation. Um, that we have under the hood already reconstructed for users. So this is really the power of, of the tool is that we're, we're solving this, this technical problem that Phil was describing before um, and, and sort of removing it from the problem for anybody who wants to look at the sort of better data that you can't really get from Twitter. Um, so 
Uh, on the left, you'll see we also get some additional information here. So we have the, the top 10 originators. So these are people who are, are posting the information and in, in, in sort of uh, who you would consider to be the problem if you're just looking at the, the raw data from Twitter. And then we also have the top 10 amplifiers. So considering the, all of these reconstructed cascades, um, you know, who do we think is actually the, the, the largest problem? As you can see, sort of flipping through between these lists, the colors of these nodes are changing. So uh, to sort of explain what that means, essentially the, the red nodes are basically whatever user or the, the users in whatever list we've selected. And then the yellow nodes are anybody who sort of immediately retweeted that problem user. Um, and uh, the blue nodes are anybody else in the, in the cascade. Something I haven't uh, explained yet is the sort of size of the node. So this includes some information as well which essentially is just showing us the total number of retweets that a, a user is getting across all of the different cascades. So you can see we've selected the originators here. So this is the worst people according to sort of the naive data from Twitter. And we can see in this cluster specifically, we're missing sort of the biggest nodes that are at the center of this uh, misinformation cluster um, that are really sort of responsible for spreading that, that, that content. So with the tool, we can just sort of just select the amplifiers and begin to begin to explore a little bit. So. You can see here uh, in this cluster, we have Kim Guilfoyle um, and Donald Trump Jr. That's not, maybe not surprising that they're sort of close together. Uh, Linda Suller is this account that maybe you know, I'm not aware of who that is. Um, Cernovich and Coulter. So again, the whole point of the tool is to explore a little bit. So I mentioned this account that I don't know, um, but what, what we can do with the tool is double click the node and this will sort of take us directly to their Twitter profile. We can see, okay, Linda Suller thinks that President Trump was the best president ever. Um, we can see that she has 347,000 followers. So we can start to get an idea how, you know, if this person isn't actually posting original misinformation, that they could sort of use that influence to amplify, uh, you know, that misinformation without it being seen. Um, and I can look at one other cluster here. So um, if we look at this one, we see we have the Dem Coalition account, um, Grant Stern account. So this, this looks maybe a little bit more liberal. Um, and again, we can do the same thing, right? So if we wanted to double click on this node, we can check out Grant Stern. Um, and we can see that uh, he's the executive editor of Occupy Democrats, which is um, a low credibility source on the left. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, I'll, I'll pause here for time, but hopefully we can kind of get a, a feeling for sort of the power of this tool and its simplicity is just that we're sort of abstracting away this difficult technical problem of doing this reconstruction and giving people better data, whether they are a, uh, a researcher or a journalist or, you know, really anybody who's interested in, in looking for, for amplifiers. Uh, and, and with that, I'll, I'll pass it back to Phil to wrap things up. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, so just to wrap things up, uh, why does this stuff matter? Well, going, going to, the, to the Aspen uh, report, uh, we are addressing especially the issue, issues of accountability, accountability norms, but also accountability about super spreaders. This will allow social media platforms to hold the most problematic actors accountable and government and independent organizations to hold the platforms accountable for, for that uh, moderation. And also uh, in, in the area of healthy digital discourse, we can quantify the impact of these hidden super spreaders and uh, this could support um, uh, uh, moderation policies that maximize reduction in harmful misinformation with minimal moderation. And of course, it will also help raise awareness about the role of misinformation amplifiers. So why us, why awesome? Well, we are a research center that studies online misinformation spread, and we've developed a lot of state-of-the-art tools to so, identify inauthentic, malicious, or harmful. No, I'm sorry, community. your time is up. I'm just, uh, yeah, just, uh, 10 seconds. Uh, and these tools are used widely by um, uh, researchers, journalists, uh, civil society organizations. So we are, we are sure that uh, they make an impact. Okay, thank you so much, and we're happy to uh, take your questions. Fantastic. Questions from the judges? Amanda, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, this is fascinating. I guess you sort of spoke to this toward the end, but again, it, I was just coming back to like the, the ultimate goal. And is it that you're hoping to compel the platforms themselves to take action? on um, another sort of subset of problematic users, or is it really more the public awareness piece of it? I'm just wondering about the platforms. I imagine they probably do have this data already and don't act on it. And so kind of wondering what bet you're gonna make there in terms of impact. 
So if you look at our past research and tools, you know, we've developed tools, for example, that have shed light on the issue of social bots and, uh, and the issue of, of coordinated uh, inauthentic campaigns. And these, once the research is out there and the public becomes aware of those issues, uh, then platforms usually respond. And we've seen that uh, recently, for example, Twitter has become better at, at moderating the action of inauthentic accounts and so has Facebook. So we think it really comes from all perspectives. We want to make these tools available to the public. We, we want to make them available to researchers so that they can more easily uh, analyze data about these uh, um, uh, diffusion cascades, data that right now is really hard to, to, to get because the existing algorithms are really uh, very, very complex. Uh, it's very difficult to do anything like this in reasonable time, uh, getting, for example, follower data. Uh, so, so this will support research, it will support end users, but it will also, I think, help put pressure on social media platforms to um, you know, to pay attention to who is amplifying misinformation. And this is especially relevant these days as we hear talks about big changes and possibly reinstating uh, some accounts who have uh, spread a lot of harmful content in the past. So um, we think that can have a big impact. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It seems, um, just to maybe clarify the intent of the tool, um, you, it, it seems more general purpose than even misamplification or amplification of misinformation of just uh, given a topic of interest or a hashtag, some kind of query to find influential nodes in the diffusion, right? Regardless of whether it's misinformation or not, right? It's just a... Yes, Deb, you're absolutely right. Of course, here we wanted to focus on the, on the disinformation portion, which we think is particularly important. But yes, uh, the tool could be a general uh, tool in terms of detecting most influential accounts, whether or not they originate uh, the information. So you're 100% correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was picking up on that somewhat. So kind of two questions. First is, I mean, there, there are other, I think, commercial applications for the tool, you know, companies that get brigaded or, you know, a Wayfair-like event. Um, you know, have you have you thought through first any commercial applications? That's one way to additionally kind of find some uh, some additional resources. And I think the second is, is there any ability to set triggers or thresholds as you're monitoring or as you're watching something emerge that that you know one of the things that we always look for is the reach, the engagement. Is this a significant uh, level of amplification and at what point. So are there, you know, do you have that sort of quantification of what severity looks like? So I'll, I'll start and then I'll let Matt add any thoughts. Uh, so on the issue about um, commercialization, uh, normally we are driven by, by, by research and all of our tools are open source, publicly available. Um, because we want to sort of maximize the applications by, you know, in the research community, journalists, civil society organizations. Um, so, so far we, we haven't um, thought about that. Uh, it's possible that there are commercial applications that usually uh, some organizations may come out and make uh, commercial versions. But uh, we think, first of all, it's important to get the research out and to raise awareness and to build a tool that is easy to use so that anybody can sort of observe and visualize what it means to, to amplify. Because we hear a lot about terms of like amplification, but, uh, but there is nothing out there to really kind of make it easy for people to, to observe that. Um, so that's an open question, maybe, but that's not our immediate goal. Um, in terms of your second question, um, you could think of lots and lots and lots of bells and whistles. <laughs> We've thought about many. And it's, it's been hard to focus this demo, uh, this initial prototype on, on something you know, narrow enough that we could describe in five minutes. Um, but yes, definitely if we are allowed to continue the development, uh, we have lots of ideas and lots of thoughts. Uh, there are different ways that you could implement this uh, using live data from Twitter, using data that is available that other researchers can submit. Uh, people can run, of course, the algorithm themselves if they want to. Um, there are ways to quantify, I mean, most of the work, the technical work under the hood that Matt and, and 
uh, Rachit and the rest of the team have been developing is exactly uh, developing efficient algorithms to quantify um, and, and therefore be able to rank and identify the, the, the worst offenders. So there is an important work in the area of, of metrics there. And in fact, we're working on a paper right now. Uh, Matt, do you wanna add anything? I'm to sorry, that? I'm sorry, Phil, we are actually at five minutes. So unfortunately we don't have time for any further sorry. thoughts, but thank you so much to the observatory for your presentations. And thanks thank to you. all four teams. Uh, what a fantastic show, we really appreciate it. So now the judges are gonna return to the green room to deliberate. And in the interim, I'd like to hand the floor over to my colleagues, uh, Vivian Schiller and Ryan Merkley to provide an update on the work of the Commission of, on Information Disorder. If time allows, our Deputy Director, Mike this level moderate questions. Over to you, Vivian and Ryan, and we'll be back soon. Great, thank you so much. And um, thank you, everybody. It's really thrilling to see these really creative uh, solutions to a lot of the challenges that um, the commission laid out in the report. And we're so thrilled to have three of our 16 commissioners here with us. Um, I'm mostly going to, the, the more interesting uh, stuff we're going to talk about is sort of what has happened since the report um, was released. But let me just say a few words for those of, uh, who are watching a little bit about the commission and the report, and then I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Ryan, to, to share what's going on. So you will recall, uh, or maybe, or, or learning for the first time, that um, Aspen Digital, again, we're a program of the Aspen Institute. We're proud that the uh, Tech Policy Hub is part of our team, that we uh, curated a group of, uh, of commissioners from um, all walks uh, of life, three of whom you see here um, that bring different perspectives, lived experiences, expertise. And uh, they spent about six, seven months um, first uh, getting versed in all the aspects of information disorder that they weren't already familiar with. Uh, most of them were our super duper expert on some parts, but maybe not on all parts. Looking at the various solutions and proposals that are out there from the brilliant researchers and policymakers, uh, both in the US and around the world. They then came up with three priorities for where they were gonna focus uh, those recommendations, which were about um, addressing harms, um, uh, about transparency, and about, oh, I used to just have this roll off my tongue. Ryan, what's the third priority? Help me. <laughs> Trust. Trust, thank you. Thank you, the most important one of all. Um, and then, um, and then narrowed down, you know, it was very hard work, um, a series of uh, recommendations uh, that, that comprise uh, most of the report that are directed at the government. Uh, this is mostly US focused um, at the state and federal level to um, tech companies, to private industry outside of the tech industry, uh, and also to uh, civil society organizations and frankly, to populations. Um, we uh, were really delighted with the attention um, that we got and the embrace of those recommendations, which immediately led to a lot of coverage and a ringing endorsement from um, the Washington Post. Uh, but you know that was not the end of the line. Uh, we did let our uh, commissioners um, take a break after that, but we have continued to pursue all of these recommendations um, uh, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a goal of uh, gaining traction. And to talk about updates and progress since then, I'm going to turn it over to Ryan Merkley, who is the uh, managing director of Aspen Digital and was the uh, lead uh, overseeing the Commission on Information Disorder for Aspen Digital. Ryan, over to you. Well, thanks, Vivian. Um, and thanks, everybody, for your presentations. And for those of you who are watching, uh, we really appreciate you being here. Uh, and uh, they're just really some great work. Um, I'm going to give you an update on some of uh, the work that we've been doing since the release of the report. So, you know, following the release of the Commission's recommendations, we've continued to engage in a set of conversations uh, pretty widely. Um, and, uh, you know, as you've uh, likely all had a look at the report, those 15 recommendations reach broadly across a variety of areas. And so we've had many different kinds of conversations. We've spoken with folks from the Biden administration. We've spoken with members of Congress, with peers and colleagues working on the disinformation challenges directly, uh, with corporations and funders uh, and civil society groups that are interested in different aspects of the report, whether it's uh, restoring faith in the media, addressing issues around norms, trust, as Vivian was saying, uh, or transparency. 
Uh, a number of the commissioners have also been speaking about their work uh, and in particular around the aspects that they're most interested in. Um, in early June, we're actually going to get our co-chairs, uh, Chris Krebs, Katie Couric, and Rashad Robinson back together at the RSA Security Conference in San Francisco, where they'll be delivering the closing keynote for that event. Um, so I want to share with you a couple of highlights uh, that uh, have happened since the release of the report, just to give you a bit of a window into the kinds of things that we've been doing uh, to keep that work going and to build momentum around some of those things that we highlighted uh, in the recommendations. Uh, so in January, we hosted a congressional briefing uh, for interested members of Congress and their staff to walk them through the recommendations, to hear their questions. Um, We've also, as I said at the beginning, reached out to the uh, Biden administration to provide them with information and ensure that the report's recommendations have the widest possible reach. About a third of the recommendations call for action from the government. So we wanted to make sure that they had an understanding of what was in that report and an opportunity to ask us questions. Um, a number of recommendations relate to local journalism. And in February, through another project that Aspen Digital was working on with the Lenfest Institute, a foundation, they're a foundation that's focused on saving local news and building more sustainable media environments. Um, we hosted uh, with them an event in Oceanside, California, where we talked about the challenges and the opportunities facing the media ecosystem. The recommendations that were in the report were actually referenced often in that in those conversations, including the need for greater diversity uh, to be reflected in newsrooms uh, and their leadership, uh, and the role that a vibrant local news ecosystem can play in rebuilding trust in a successful and healthy democracy. Um, I'll talk a little bit about our cyber summit. So the Commission on Information Disorder was actually originally an idea that came out of uh, the Aspen Digital's cyber group, um, which focuses on cybersecurity issues. Um, it identified disinformation as an emerging security threat, uh, which led ultimately to the Commission's work. Now, at the cyber group's fall meeting in Washington, D.C., the topic of disinformation, including its application in the war in Ukraine, came up often. And we're going to keep looking for ways that that cybersecurity work and our focus on disinformation can intersect and cross-pollinate. Uh, a few weeks ago at Stanford, uh, President Obama spoke uh, on the topic of disinformation, an area that he's been increasingly focused on. Um, and in advance of that meeting, he published a reading list of articles and reports. Uh, I will say we were absolutely delighted to see that the commission's report was at the top of his list. Um, and perhaps even more encouraging was that many of his solutions were aligned with recommendations uh, that were outlined in the report. So we're happy to see uh, that having a further reach and, and interest. I guess lastly is a thing that's coming soon. Uh, the commission's composition and its focus were really ideal for developing insights and recommendations in a US context. Um, but we knew that that was limited. We knew uh, we had the capacity to deliver against that, that sort of more narrow focus, but we also knew uh, that we wanted to engage more broadly uh, in a global conversation about some of those issues after the commission concluded its report. Uh, so we're actually beginning that work this summer and in planning right now with an initial series of closed door meetings in some European cities in June. Uh, we'll be in London, Berlin and Brussels. Uh, we'll be looking uh, and hosting a series of exploratory meetings to identify the sort of next round of topics that we want to explore, but also looking for common threads that come out of the report and its recommendations to see what of those recommendations might also hold true in other contexts. Now. Um, while we think the commission uh, structure was pretty successful, we'll probably look for alternatives that allow us to have an even larger dialogue, uh, and there'll be more to come on that, and uh, we'll be excited to share that as things develop. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, some of the things that we've been up to. Vivian, maybe I'll hand it back to you and, and Mai, if you want to uh, take questions, if we have time, we're happy to do it. That pretty much covers where we are. Uh, I don't know if we have time, Mai, for any questions, but we're happy to take them if there are any. Yes, we do have time as the judges deliberate. So a reminder to the, the audience members to use the Q&A box below if you have any questions for Ryan and Vivian. And thank you so much, uh, Ryan and Vivian, for, for giving us an update uh, on what the commission has been doing ever since the report was released. Um, the first question we have is, do any of the recommendations that uh, the report talks about or any of your subsequent conversations uh, touch on the advertising supply chain? Uh, so this audience member states so many publishers use intermediary, in intermediaries to sell ad, yet they don't seem to take any responsibility for those. 
Uh, yeah, there's there's two that I think are the sort of obvious connections to that. Um, one, uh, which is a, a very direct connection to, av- actually three, I guess. So one is around advertising transparency. So one of the recommendations asks for a database uh, and a tracking of all ad transparency, which is a sort of prerequisite for the kind of conversation that I think the questioner is leading us to, which is... It, to answer the question of who's involved and, and who's being targeted, you need to actually have that information. And so that's sort of one fundamental piece uh, that contributes to being able to answer that. Um, secondly, in the recommendation around Section 230, uh, which is about immunity for the platforms against posted content, one of the commission's recommendations, and also I would note former President Obama's recommendations, um, is that the um, uh, is that advertising no longer be um, Uh, exempt from um, immunity on the platforms, meaning that there would be a a sort of higher level of accountability for the content that is posted, um, which we think would lead to some, uh, some greater accountability for all the players involved in the advertising industry. And I guess the last one is the recommendation around norms, uh, which talks about the sort of non-law based ways that we think about how we relate. Uh, and one of those key norms in a, ways that, a way that consumers and pub, uh, civil society can apply pressure is to force companies to be more accountable for where they spend their advertising and how they target it, be it whether they're targeting it to groups in ways that are not appropriate or whether they're working on platforms that don't behave appropriately. I think that creates an opportunity for an accountability amongst those um, those advertisers and advertising intermediaries that facilitate that kind of spending. Uh, so exerting consumer uh, and public pressure around norms. Great, thank you, Ryan. Um, uh, a question: Have you heard? Have you ha- seen any response from the private sector on on your recommendations in the report? So you talked a little bit about engaging with government and civil yeah. society, but anything from the private sector? I, I can take that one. Yeah, we're actually deep in. There's nothing really to announce yet, but we're actually deep in conversation. And when we think about the private sector um, in the case of uh, the Commission on Information Disorder, we're thinking about it in two parts. There is the tech industry, the private sector tech industry to whom a lot of these recommendations are quite specifically targeted, those that have um, that, that provide user-generated content that are driven by algorithmic decision-making and targeting and, and have the data. And there's a number of different recommendations for them. But there's also you know, reference, and, and Ryan mentioned our norms recommendation, about um, the, uh, the, the rest of the private sector who are the economic engine, frankly, for the platforms. Um, you know, the Fortune 50, 100, 500 companies that uh, both put out their own content um, uh, that they generate, but also um, uh, put out, you know, what end up as ads that again, drive the, the, uh, the business models for these platforms and what responsibility they have in terms of their behaviors and actions um, in, in, in many forms across the board on the ecosystem. So we're talking to them about that as well. I would just jump in and, and add to that that really there's sort of at both ends of the spectrum there is opportunity and there is risk. Uh, the report uh, kind of highlights right up front that um, you know increasingly we are seeing disinformation targeting companies directly. So if you're Dominion voting machines or if you're um, you know a pharmaceutical company, uh, you've been the target uh, of that kind of disinformation. Um, and then the opportunity is for leadership. Uh, the Edelman Trust uh, Barometer identified CEOs as one of the most trusted groups. I think that's an opportunity for them to be uh, truth tellers, both to their employees, where they have large uh, bodies of employees, or to the public about things uh, like getting a vaccine or you know other issues that are of public interest. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I think we are at time now, so I will hand it back to Betsy to transition to the uh, announcement of the winner. Thanks so much for your patience, everyone. Uh, We're excited to announce that after a quick 15 minutes, we do have a winner. And so I'm gonna pass it over to our commissioner, Chris, who will uh, be revealing the winner. Chris, over to you. Hey, uh, thanks, Betsy. And first off, just congratulations to all the participants. Uh, all four projects were, uh, were really impressive. There's a lot of thought. I personally appreciated how you all tracked against uh, the, the recommendations of the commission. And I, you know, it, it felt a little, you know, felt a little seen that, that the things that we had recommended last year uh, had manifested in, in some projects here. Uh, all that said, there's, there's gotta be a winner here, right? There's, there's gotta be someone that takes home uh, the $75,000 
award. And after, as Betsy mentioned, the deliberation, we, uh, we picked Agents of Influence. So congratulations to the team. <laughs> congratulations, team. Uh, we are very <laughs> excited to award you. Um, and congratulations on your well-deserved victory. Uh, we'd like to take a moment to thank everyone who made this event possible. Uh, first, we'd like to uh, we'd like to thank Craig Newmark Philanthropies and Exanti, an initiative of Smit Futures, uh, for having uh, given us the opportunity to pull this together. We are extraordinarily appreciative to you both for that funding. Um, to our contestants and judges, all four contestants did an absolutely amazing job presenting, and it was a very, very difficult decision. Thank you so much for taking the time. To our judges for your evaluations, thank you very much for being with us and for taking the time to really uh, think through these questions, which are so important. Uh, to my Sisla, Meha Aluwalia, and Maeve Snedden of the Aspen Tech Policy Hub team for a flawless webinar other than me and uh, for helping to pull together such an amazing contest. And to Vivian, Ryan, Diera, and the Commission on Information Disorder for inspiring this contest and for helping to select the semifinalists. Information disorder remains one of the world's great challenges, and we're delighted to have taken a small step today towards improving our approach for it. Please stay tuned for future challenge prize opportunities as we look forward to taking small steps towards solving big problems at the intersection of technology and society. Thanks so much again, and have a wonderful day.